morning and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 9. We're going to start in chapter 9 and move into chapter 10 today. We'll start reading in Ecclesiastes 9, 13 and go through chapter 10. The Bible says, I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might that the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfume's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but fools have a heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, and some or some winged creature tell the matter. This is God's word. Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you know somebody that you would consider to be wise? Raise your hands. Someone you consider to be wise. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, many of you raise your hands, but not everyone. How many of you know someone you consider to be a fool? A few more hands. Don't point to them right now, okay? Um, well, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon speaks a lot about wisdom and foolishness. He does the same thing in the book of Proverbs. And in this portion of the book of Ecclesiastes, he kind of compares them one to another. And it's interesting in this passage that Solomon actually speaks quite a bit more about foolishness than he does wisdom. And I think the reason for that is, remember, Solomon is speaking about life under the sun, normal human life. And we know that there is an abundance of foolishness in our world, isn't there? And there's really a true lack of wisdom sometimes. And even if you consider it on a personal level, I mean, we can all identify with making lots of stupid choices, can't we? But sometimes we've probably not made as many wise choices. And and Solomon is just the perfect author to write this. Because when he was young, he was chosen by God to follow his father David as the king. And he asked God for wisdom to govern God's people well. And God answered that prayer. He honored that prayer. Listen to what it says. It says that God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. 
for he was wiser than all other men. And listen to this. And, and the people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. We know that he was gifted by God with wisdom. And yet, despite that, we also know that Solomon still made some really foolish decisions. Because the Bible also says this about Solomon. That when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. So Solomon unwisely turned his attention away from God towards the world's temptations such as privilege and power and, and riches and sex and, and the praise of other people. And as he did, he fell into sin and that sin that he fell into was so destructive, really it kind of ruined his life. So Solomon's life shows us that no matter how smart we may think we are, and even, let me say it this way, no matter how much we may love God at the moment, the foolishness of sin can overtake us and overwhelm us if we don't intentionally guard our hearts against it. And if we don't actively pursue God's wisdom each and every day. So the first thing that I want to talk about today is in chapter 9, and that is why we should appreciate wisdom. Why we should appreciate wisdom. To the ancient Jews, wisdom was really, it was, it was one of the highest virtues that a person could possess. In fact, the Old Testament mentions wisdom 222 times at least. And in this passage, Solomon speaks of wisdom six times. But before we really get into what Solomon says about wisdom, we kind of need to define it. In Hebrew, the word wisdom actually carries the idea of skillfulness in action. So I think a good definition of wisdom would be this. It's simply skill for living. Think about this. A young man once loaned a friend $500 uh, but he failed to get uh, his, the borrower's signature on a receipt. And so the guy hadn't paid him back after a year. And he realized he's probably never going to get his money back. And $500 is a lot of money. So he asked his dad, what should I do? And his dad said, well, what you need to do is write him a letter and tell him that you need the $1,000 that he loaned you. And his son said, wait a minute, you mean 500 He said, no, you need to say 1000 because he will immediately write you back and tell you that he only owed you 500 and then you've got it in writing. <laughs> I'd say his father gave him some wise, wise counsel, wouldn't you? Well, in a very similar way, God, our Heavenly Father, in His Word, gives us wise counsel that we can benefit greatly from if we will just listen to His wisdom. In chapter 9, verses 13 through 18, Solomon really shares with us some great benefits uh, of God's wisdom. And the first thing we learn is this, that wisdom is better than human strength. Solomon tells this really incredible story. It's a story about this city that's filled with underdogs. It's a story about a small city. There are only a few people that live there, and they were attacked by a large nation, by a king with a great army. And it seems like the army and the king had everything they needed to defeat this little city except for one thing, wisdom. In fact, the Bible says that this little city was delivered from the hand of this army by a nameless and poor but very, very wise man. You see, our society, we just glorify strength, don't we? I mean, we are enamored with strength, especially physical strength. But we understand that it is wisdom that actually brings us through the hard times of life. In Ecclesiastes 7.12, Solomon says that wisdom actually preserves the life of him that has it. And in Ecclesiastes 7.19, listen to this. It says, wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Now, did you catch that? Look at that verse. Listen to the odds. The advantage of wisdom over strength is 10 to 1. How many of you realize that there are some pretty good odds? And so no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we have to remember that wisdom and having God's wisdom is really the only way we can properly navigate the troubled waters of this life. Another advantage of wisdom over strength is this, that 
we know that as we get older, our strength fails, doesn't it? In fact, i got to confess to you. Some of, some of you wish me happy birthday today. Thank you for that. I turned 45 today. I told my mom yesterday when I talked to her that um, April 22nd, 1973 was a banner day in the history of mankind. She said, well, it was for me. I said, well, thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. But, but here's the thing. Our strength, our natural, all the good things we have, all the power we have, they fade. I, I confess to you, the last several weeks, I have had to start printing out my sermons in 14 font because I can't see the notes on the page. And this week, I had to break down and order myself a large print Bible for preaching. I'm not even going to talk about the way my knees feel and my back feel, all right? But the truth is, as we advance in years, physical strength begins to kind of recede. But as we age, we can and we should grow in wisdom, shouldn't we? There's nothing worse than someone who is an adult but still makes decisions like a child, is there? Think about it. There was a strong young man at a construction site. He would brag that he could, he was a big, strong guy. He would brag that he could do, uh, he could outdo anyone in feats of strength. And, and he would really make fun of the older guys that he worked with, especially this one guy. And so after several minutes, again, of giving these guys a hard time, uh, the old guy said, you know what? Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? He said, I'll bet you a week's paycheck that I can carry something in a wheelbarrow over to that building that you will not be able to carry back. The man, his eyes got big, and he said, you're on, old man. So the young worker replied, and, and he, so the man grabbed the wheelbarrow, he grabbed the handles, and he looked at the young man, and he said, all right, get in. It's pretty good, isn't it? So, J.J., I have a contest for you later. Um, <laughs> but this older man outsmarted the younger man by his wisdom. See, wisdom in our world won't be celebrated a lot. It won't necessarily gain you popularity. But it does tend to win the day. And it does tend to make things go better. And, and you think about the church. I was thinking about the church this week. Although our church focuses a lot on youth, uh, whether it's through the Awana program or through Frontline, and, and we ought to do that. It's important to bring the gospel to the next generation. But we never need to do that to the exclusion of those that are older. Folks, honestly, it's a mistake. Like, I'll be honest with you. I think it is a sin when a church focuses on the strength of youth to the exclusion of the wisdom of years. See, the church needs both. And one of the things is, as people come and visit, we've had uh, different pastors that have come at different times, and one of the things they like to comment on is that we have such a neat blend of ages in our church. And I think that is so precious. I think that is important. I think that is a key ingredient to a healthy church because the church needs the strength of youth, no doubt about it, but we also need the wisdom of those that have lived and that have given their lives in service for Christ. And so understand that wisdom is greater than strength, the Scripture says. The second thing we see in these verses is that wisdom is better than human passion. Uh, the, the Bible says in verse 17 that the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Now, we live in a society where the bigger the complaint, the greater the demonstration, the louder the cry of injustice, whether real or perceived, the more people will just blindly line up to follow the cause, even if it's wrong and even if they don't have all the facts. In fact, you know that it was Joseph Goebbels, and I don't know if you know who that is. He was in charge of Adolf Hitler's propaganda machine in Nazi Germany. He said this. He said, if you tell a lie loud enough and keep repeating it, people will come to believe it. And you know what the sad thing is? Is that sometimes, in fact, probably a lot of times, godly wisdom and counsel often falls on deaf ears. And yet, ungodly wisdom and counsel gets swallowed hook, line, and sinker. But don't forget this, folks, that God said there is a way 
that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. See, it is far better to listen to the still, small, quiet voice of God's wisdom than the loud cry that is made by fools all across our world. And finally, we learn this, that wisdom is better than human weapons. Verse 18 says it this way, wisdom is better than weapons of war. And the weapons that are referred to there are the weapons that they would use to do battle. And Solomon says that if he was given the choice between uh, wisdom and skill, he would take that over weaponry. And it's a direct reference back to the story of the wise man who saved the city. He didn't save the city with great weapons. He saved the city with great wisdom. And for the believer, there will always come a time when there will be a temptation to, to jump on board some new thing or, or some new idea or some new uh, temptation or some new method of escape or some new weapon to fight the battle. But what we really need during the battles of life is God's gift of wisdom to carry us through. And so Solomon wants us to know we should appreciate the wisdom that God gives. But he also wants us to recognize this, and that is why we should reject foolishness. foolishness. We should appreciate and embrace wisdom, but we should reject foolishness. So in the, in the middle of this passage, when Solomon is kind of praising wisdom, he warns us of the dangers of foolish behavior. Solomon wrote three books in the Bible, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And he used the word fool, fools, foolish, and folly at least 128 times. And in Ecclesiastes 10, he speaks of foolishness nine times. And it's really important for us to understand something here. The idea of foolishness in the Bible has nothing to do with a person's educational level. You see, people without any formal education can be incredibly wise. And people with incredible education can be extremely foolish. See, both wisdom and foolishness, they really have a very moral and spiritual ingredient to them, especially biblically. Remember, it is the fool who says in his heart, what? That there is no God, right? So God offers wisdom, and those who follow his ways, God calls wise. Those who reject his ways, God calls a fool. So really, here's a definition for foolishness. Foolishness is the rejection of of God's wisdom for life. It is living life without any thought for God. That's really what foolishness is. In chapter 10, I see several lessons for us about foolishness. And again, there's more about foolishness than there is about wisdom. The first thing is this. Foolishness is destructive. We see that in the last verse of chapter 9 and the first verse of chapter 10, where it says, One sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Saying that a little fly uh, makes the, the, the perfume stink. That's where we get this idea, this phrase, there's a fly in the ointment. It was kind of Solomon's graphic way of saying that even just a little tiny bit of foolishness can destroy a person's dignity and reputation that they've gained by wisdom. Flies are kind of insignificant. I mean, they're just little things in the overall scheme of things. But a perfumer's oil, that costs a lot of money to make. That took a lot of skill to make. And what this passage is teaching us is that the insignificant, the things that are foolish in this world, can actually destroy the things that are valuable. This is the way Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. He said, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So listen, you know what? Even a little bit of foolishness, can leave in its path a terrible wake of destruction. Foolishness can destroy marriages. It can destroy friendships. It can destroy companies. It can destroy churches. And it can destroy all the lives of those around it. It is like a black hole that just swallows everything up in its wake. And so it is incredibly destructive. Two, foolishness leads us down the wrong roads. You know, the foolish person has a way of making their foolishness clearly evident by the road that they take in life, by the direction that they take in life. We've all known people, and maybe we've been that person, who's warned and who's advised, don't go this way, and yet 
they do it anyway, and we sit and we watch them suffer terribly because they did not listen to the advice of wisdom. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's sad. We even see that sometimes in the life of church people. I mean, the Bible may clearly teach a, a, a certain way of living, and yet we want something else. We don't want to live the way God says. So what we do is we either try to fit the Bible into modern society, or we, we want to make the Bible approve of our circumstance or of our experience. So what do we do? We try to convince ourselves that God doesn't really mean what he says. And so we say things like this, and I cringe when I hear things like this. Well, that's not my interpretation. Or, or well, that's not how I see it. Folks, can I just be real transparent with you and real honest and, and blunt? It doesn't matter how we see it. It matters how God says it and whether we will obey what God says. Or I love, H.B. Charles just said this recently. I heard him say it. He said this, the gospel is the message and we do not have editorial control. Or someone wiser than me once said it this way, he said that the wise will find themselves more concerned and compelled to obey than to be justified. See, foolishness will lead us down the wrong road. Now, there's no doubt that God has a path for us to walk. And it's clearly laid out in His Word. Listen to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said these words. He said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are, by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. Jesus also said these words, and, and probably many of you know them. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, true wisdom always points to Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation, as the only truth worth believing, and as the only life worth living. And the question for all of us today is this, do we know Christ today? Are we walking the path that comes with knowing Jesus, the narrow path? If that's not you today, let me tell you the good news of the gospel. The good news is that you can get on that road today by simply repenting of your sin, putting your trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you can walk the narrow road which leads to life with Jesus. So we understand foolishness is destructive. It leads us down wrong roads. It also keeps us from getting a job well done. Verses 4 through 11, as well as verse 18. Solomon gives these illustrations of everyday work projects. I mean, he talks about, you know, fixing a wall and things like that. And, and each of those illustrations kind of give us the same point. And the point is this. Think before you act. As I was reading this, I thought about my mother quite a bit, telling me, why don't you ever think about these things before you do them? I don't know, Mom, I'm just a kid. You're 24. Think, boy. Sorry. Um... The idea is don't just work hard, take precautions, work smart. And as I was reading these verses, and some of you may have heard this story, but I couldn't help but think about the time when Nate Johnson was reshingling his house. He needed some help. So I thought, well, I can do that. I can get up on the roof, no problem. I can help reshingle it. I'm a man, I'm tough. Yeah, I believe that, right? But I had also been struggling for several months with vertigo. Now, if you know what vertigo is, it, this is what vertigo is. Vertigo makes you feel like when you're standing still, the entire world is spinning like this. I mean, and so I would wait. I was, I was struggling with it, but I thought, you know what? I got to get out there and I got to help. So I climbed up the ladder and got on the roof. And it was not long before everybody there knew that I had made a foolish decision. I couldn't get anywhere near the edge of the roof because when I got close, it was like, blah. I couldn't get down off the ladder because it was on the edge of the roof. And every time I came to it, it was like, We tried to get the crane operator to pick me up and take me down. They said it couldn't handle the weight. No, I didn't say that. They just said their insurance wouldn't cover it. So Janine called a fireman friend of hers. He said, and he said, well, we could get him down 
we could bring the fire truck, put the ladder up, bring them down, but we'd have to turn the sirens on and get the police involved and all that. And I said, I'm not doing that. You can see the headline, Mike Gaynor's coming, pastor gets stuck on top of roof. <laughs> you know what they had to do? Poor Nate had to pull up a sheet of his roof totally off and lower me down into the attic so that I could go through the hole, and there's Lisa at the bottom going, come on, I'm helping, I'm helping, I'm helping. <laughs> and all because, I'll put it in today's vernacular, because I was an idiot. I was foolish. I made a foolish choice. And here's the moral to the story. Yes, we ought to work hard, but work smart. Don't be foolish, because taking chances could literally come back to bite you in the end. So, foolishness keeps us from getting a job well done. It also keeps, have you ever noticed this? Foolishness leads to endless talking. One lesson that wise people have to learn is that a fool never, ever shuts up. They just continue to talk incessantly. They never know when to stop. And it's not just endless talk. It's often very destructive talk. So I love this verse in Proverbs 10, 19. I like how it comes across in the NLT. It says, too much talk leads to sin. So be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Now our words are important. So much so that we will give an account for every word we, says, we say, Jesus says. In fact, here's what he said. He said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give an account for every careless word they speak. Man, that's why James would tell us, let every person be what? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And when you think about it, there's some incredible benefits to keeping our mouth closed and talking less. Um, number one, we can actually listen carefully to what others say. I mean, you, you can't listen when you're talking. Number two, we have time to kind of frame our thoughts and our responses Number three, our friends begin to value our words because we've actually taken the time to listen to what they say. And number four, honestly, we run a much lower risk of saying something foolish. In fact, again, a wise person, you probably all heard this, said this, it is far better to be thought of a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So, foolishness leads to constant talking. And then lastly, Foolishness corrupts entire nations. Verses 16 and 17 talks about the leaders and their foolishness. And it, it speaks about a nation's need for mature and wise leaders. Again, Solomon himself felt that he was just a child when he became king, so how could he rule God's people? And therefore he asked God for a, the gift of wisdom, and God gave him that. He understood that a land is blessed by good, faithful leaders, but cursed under wicked and incompetent leaders. Remember, it was actually Solomon who wrote in Proverbs 14 that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That is why, and let me just, let me just say this, that is why the right that we have in America to cast a vote for our leaders is such a sacred privilege. And we should use wisdom as we select our leaders because foolish leaders can bring down an entire nation. Now, let me give this to you, although it's not in your bulletin. I, I was just thinking of this as I was finishing up this week. Let me give you two ways that we can all gain wisdom. And I'll put them on the screens here for you. Number one, surround yourself with wise people instead of fools. Proverbs 13.20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Or as one guy I used to work with said it, he said it's really hard to soar with the eagles when you work with a bunch of turkeys. So surround yourself with people that are wise, not fools. And secondly, if you need wisdom, and let me just ask this, how many of you would say there are situations in your life right now that you need wisdom about. Okay. Only people under 10 didn't raise their hand. Right? So if you need wisdom, listen, just ask God for it. What a, I love this promise in the scripture. It says this, if you need wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it 
will be given him. What a promise from God's word. Just ask. God, give me wisdom. Let me close with this story and then we're through. A man walked into a convenience store, put a $20 bill on the counter, asked for change. Then when the clerk opened the, the, the cash register drawer, the man took a gun out, stuck it in his face and said, give me all the money. So the man unloaded the cash register and gave it to him. But he left the $20 bill sitting on the counter. You know how much money he got out of the register? $15. He left more money on the counter than he got for robbing the guy. Now we read that and we think, what a fool. Remember there was a TV show years ago called Stu Things Stupid Criminals Do? Something like that. But you know what? Can I just be real transparent and real honest? I think we often, and I say we, we often exchange God's wisdom found so clearly in his word with man's foolishness. And we don't think anything about it. So here's what I want all of us to do and know this week and for the rest of our lives. Let's do our best to reject foolishness and embrace wisdom so that we can live our lives skillfully to the glory and honor of God. Let's bow for prayer. I would ask you, first of all, are you on the narrow road walking with Jesus? Do you know Christ? Have you repented of your sin and given your life to Christ, confessed Him as your Lord and Savior. By doing that, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can get on that narrow road which leads to life that Jesus talked about. And if you're here today and you've not done that, I just want you to know, God loves you and God gave His Son to die for you. And you can know Him today by receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. Now I'm thankful by God's grace, I've done that. And many of you have. But I know that there are lots of parents here. There are lots of spouses. There are lots of single folks. There are teenagers. There are grandmas and grandpas. I mean, it just runs the gamut. And you know what? Every one of us needs God's wisdom. And so let me just pray for us. Our God... First of all, we confess to you that we are a foolish people at times. Honestly, Lord, the, the comparisons to your church and the people of Israel from the Old Testament sometimes are so easy to see. Sometimes, God, we are a stiff-necked people who want our own way and sometimes refuse to listen to your wisdom. And so, God, you challenge us. In, in many ways, you rebuke us to stop embracing foolishness and the foolishness of this world and turn our hearts and minds over to the wisdom of God found in his word found on the narrow road in our walk with Christ so Lord I pray for myself today I pray for the leaders in our church I pray for each person in our church especially those that are here today that Lord we would reject foolishness we would embrace your wisdom and we would follow you that as we've seen in the book of Ecclesiastes we would certainly embrace life and enjoy it but we would also embrace your wisdom as we navigate the muddy waters of life and that God you would use us to your glory and your honor and Lord we thank you in Christ's name Amen stand with us if you will we will have one song, and then Jim France will come make an announcement. He'll close us in prayer.